When toiling is ended and my burdens are laid down, what glory will then be mine? My robe will be spotless and I'll put on a bright crown in heaven. I'll shout and shine. Gonna shine, gonna shout, gonna shine, gonna shine in that city of love divine. Over there, over there, free from care, free from care. With the same, I shall shout and shine. There'll be no more sorrow in that homeland of the soul. My spirit will never pine. I'll stand in that number and make sweet melodies roll in heaven. I'll shout and shine. Gonna shine. Gonna shine. shine. In that city of love divine. Over there. Over there. Free from care, with the same I shall shout and shine. I'll never be lonesome in that glad city so fair, and all will be joy divine. Many of my loved ones and my neighbors will be there in heaven. I'll shout and shine. Gonna shine, gonna shine, gonna shine in that city of love divine. Over there, over there, free from care, free from care. With the same, I shall shout and shine. Gonna shine, gonna shine, in that city of love divine. From care with the same, I shall shout and shine. Amen. I'm looking for forward to heaven. Are you? Amen. Well, church gets to be just a little slice of heaven, I think, and uh, what a gift that is to be able to be with God's people and sing the Lord's praises and bow down and worship Him and hear from His Word. I'm telling you, it's just a little, little glimpse of all the good things to come in eternity. Exodus is where we are tonight, Exodus chapter 22, <clears throat> and going into chapter 23. We're not going to... Uh, pre-read our text here tonight um, because we're just going to sort of uh, march our way through the entire uh, passage during this the course of the message. But it's uh, going to be in Exodus chapter 22, and we're going to be talking tonight about covenant rights and responsibilities. Rights and responsibilities go hand in hand, and uh, with that, let's ask the Lord's blessings. Heavenly Father, we uh, do love you, and uh, we're glad to be here tonight. We're thankful for your word, this, um, this law that you gave unto your people Israel. It is uh, good. It is profitable even for us to take a, take a look at it tonight, to study it out. Pray that you'd uh, be glorified in all that's said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. Here in the United States of America, we are very familiar with the concept of certain human rights that have been granted to us by our Creator. Things like freedom and liberty and the defense of inalienable rights. Man, that's all as American as apple pie, isn't it? It is. And, and, and that's good. And we talked about some of those inalienable rights. And uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were in Exodus 21 and, and uh, we were uh, looking at this book of the covenant, this portion of Exodus that laid down the basic framework for the Israelites' system of government and of justice. And we saw how that the covenant code, as it's sometimes called, uh, gave the people of Israel the basic rights of things like life and liberty. And uh, we're going to get into the, the rights to property and things like that here tonight. And I'm thankful for those rights. But one thing about 
the rights that we have as Americans that the founders understood, but Americans many today have forgotten, is that our rights are built upon certain responsibilities, certain duties. It seems like everybody's grabbing for more rights these days. I want my rights. Uh, nobody's grabbing for more responsibility, but, but those two go together. Uh, we, we said during our study of the Ten Commandments that the law that was given at uh, Mount Sinai was in this whole framework, this backdrop of a people that had just been set free from bondage. They'd just been delivered out of Egypt. And so it, it's like God has made them free now, but if they hope to remain a free people... They have to follow these commandments from the Lord. These responsibilities that are laid down here are really what their freedom and their rights were built upon. And so we're going to look at really the rest of this book of the covenant. It's going to be one big chunk this evening. And it might be helpful for you to think that we're going into like a time of Bible study here tonight. All right. It's, uh, it's sometimes when we're preaching, I try to fire like a rifle. We're going for one idea here. Tonight's a little bit more like scatter scattergun, and, uh, but there's something that you need to grab a hold of here tonight that the Holy Spirit has for you. A lot of content, but we're going to break it down into five key areas of the law regarding the rights and the responsibilities of God's covenant people of Israel. The first section of law we're going to deal with tonight is regarding personal property. And with regarding personal property, the principle is this, make things right. If, may, if you make things wrong, make them right. Uh, when it came to the theft or the destruction of personal property, Israel's code of justice emphasized restitution. Restore what you stole. Pay back a penalty to the one who suffered the loss. Uh, in the first verse there, it talks about if a, if a thief were convicted of stealing an animal, like an ox or a sheep or something like that, they would have to pay back the equivalent of five times the worth of an ox or four times the worth of the original sheep. Now, that's a, that's a steep penalty. And it would make a thief think twice, like, can I really get ahead by stealing this sheep? If, I've got to turn, if I get caught, i got to turn around and pay it back fourfold. And it's, it's just such an interesting little tidbit here for you that this, this law came up recently in, in our preaching in Luke. That in Luke chapter 19, when uh, Zacchaeus turned back to the Lord, one of the signs of his repentance was his, his desire to make things right for those who, that he had cheated and that he had stole from. And he committed that he was going to restore whatever he had stolen from others fourfold. Now, that number didn't just come out of thin air. It was, that was the penalty under the covenant for someone that had stolen so, so Zacchaeus understood that portion of the law. If a thief broke into your home to steal, under the law, you couldn't just automatically kill someone for that, all right? There wasn't exactly the, like the castle doctrine there. If, if there was a difference. If it was during the day and you could identify the, the thief, well, the idea was, you can, you can tell the, the authorities who that was. They can apprehend them and make restitution. But at night, and you don't know what a burglar's intentions are. You don't know what they've come in, in there for. They, they may have come to kill you. And so just like in our system of law, uh, if you're in fear of your life, you could defend yourself with lethal means and it not be considered murder. Look at verse 2 with me. If a thief be found breaking up, and like breaking in, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, so if, it, if it's daytime instead of nighttime, there shall be shed, blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he should be sold for his theft. So we have a principle here that the theft of stuff, of property, is not worth the taking of a life. You can't defend stuff by killing someone. And if you do, under this code anyway, it was murder and you would face the consequences. But if it's at night, man, you'd be justified to uh, defend your life, defend your, your family in danger. And self-defense was justified killing. 
Under this code of laws, the destruction of property was treated basically the same as theft. In verse 5, if you were to let your animals go feed in your neighbor's crops, well, then you needed to pay for that loss. You need to make that right. If uh, you start a fire and your fire breaks out and, and torches the field of your neighbor, well, you're responsible to pay for that. It doesn't really matter if you meant to torch their crops or not. They, they suffered a loss uh, at your hands, and you need to make it right. Verse 7 deals with an interesting case study. What if you were, say, leaving town, and you asked your neighbor to take care of some possessions for you or an animal for you? How responsible would, would that neighbor be if something happened to it while it was in their care? Uh, it gives give several scenarios there. If the property is stolen and the thief is found, well, then the regular rules apply. You know, the thief pays back double the, the neighbor. He's off the hook. But down in verse 12, it tells us if it be stolen from him, he shall make restitution unto the owner thereof. You say, man, is that fair? You know, I, I, I gave this piece of property to, to Brother Levi and said, hey, I'm going out of town. Uh, would you hold on to this for me? And then somebody breaks into his place, steals it from him. Well, guess what? He, by, by accepting the care of it, he was also accepting the responsibility for it. Uh, otherwise, I could have just left it laying out, out in the open for anybody to steal. It's this idea of tr I'm trusting you with this. And uh, so you take on that responsibility and have to pay it back. One possibility, if something goes missing, is that the neighbor you lent it to is actually the thief. And if there's suspicion of that, it gives parameters like, hey, bring in the judges and make an investigation and an inquiry. And uh, verse 8, it says, if the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he have put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. And so then if he's convicted, he's got to restore it double in verse 9. If it's an animal, let's say you're a shepherd, and uh, one's going to a shepherd's conference, and uh, he, he hands over his, some of his sheep to this shepherd, and a, a wolf comes in, or something's destroyed, or uh, they, they, they run away out in the field. Well, that's not necessarily deemed the neighbor's fault who's in care, but he does have to swear this oath between the two of them that he had nothing to do with it. Then, it, then it's kind of like, well, what if, what if the, it got initiated the other way? Like, rather than me saying, hey, Brother Levi, would you hang on to this for me? What if Brother Levi came to me and said, hey, pastor, would it be okay if I borrowed your trailer or whatever it was? Could I borrow that from you? He initiated it. Well, now he's, he's got a little more responsibility because he, he started that whole e e equation. So uh, if, the, if, the, if you borrow something and the owner is not with you when it breaks, or if it's an animal, when it dies, then you need to replace it, and you need to make it right, okay? So I understand we're not, uh, we're not bound to these things as far as law goes, but th these are some good just ethical principles too. One time when I was in Bemidji, I borrowed a pressure washer from a church member, and I was using it just to clean up the outside of the church there and in the springtime, whatever. And, and man, that thing just broke, smoke coming out of it and everything. And it, it just died on me. Well, in that case, I felt like, you know what I need to do, or at least the church needs to replace that. You know, I borrowed it from him and, and it died in my care. And so I'm going to buy him a new one. And we did that. But, but if... What if the, the, mem the church member had said, oh, you need that done? Don't worry about it. I'll bring my pressure washer. I'll run my pressure washer. I don't want you to run my pressure washer. You might kill it, Pastor. But if, he, if he knew what, was, what he was doing, he'd probably done that. But, but he said, I'll just take care of that sometime. And then it breaks while he's using it. Totally different scenario. It, it, it broke down in the care of the owner, so no restitution is made there. Or not required. You might as a, as a good gesture or something, but it was in his care. If it's something that you rented, you actually paid money to use it. Well, that's part of the reason you paid the money was for the use of it. And if it breaks down, that's really on the person who rented it out. If you go rent a U-Haul trailer 
and it gets a flat or uh, the axle snaps or something terrible goes wrong, you're not on the hook for the cost of the whole trailer. You, you already paid for that. It is part of your rent. That's, that's kind of the principle that's, that's found there in some of these verses 14 and 15. As we come down to verses 16, 17, they could fit in, in either point here, but we're going to move it to the next point because uh, we don't think of daughters as personal property, amen? Uh, they're not that way. So we're going to put it in the next session, section. Rather than regarding personal property, now we move on to regarding moral purity, moral purity. And if, if the principle behind uh, personal property is make it right, the principle behind moral purity is live right. Verse 16. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father either utterly refuse to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. Now the penalties for this under the law would have been very different if the woman were married or if she had been engaged when the sinful relationship took place, because the penalty for adultery in this system of justice was death. But here the idea is you've got two single consenting adults. To the world, that makes it A-OK, -okay. not to the Lord. No, it's still sin. It's an act of immorality, but it's not treated the same as like a violation to the marriage bond. And so... I mean, think about bring in the New Testament principle for Christians where it says flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price." Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, under Israel's law, the man was to offer to marry the girl that he had been with. Because the sexual act is a powerful bond. It is the becoming of one flesh with another person. And that's something that only belongs in a relationship bound by the covenant of marriage. That's where that belongs. Now, it's entirely possible in a scenario like this that the guy is a total loser and the father does not want his daughter to marry this guy forever because of one sinful mistake. And so the father had the right to refuse to allow the marriage. So can you imagine the guy getting down on one knee saying, will you? And the dad says, eh, veto. <laughs> not necessary, son. Uh, and, uh, but either way, the man who sinned in that relationship was still required to pay the dowry to her parents, even if she would not become his wife. And that's because this act would bring financial loss to the family. She was no longer a virgin. Therefore, the dowry that any future husband might be willing to pay would be substantially less. And so you see here how there's both a financial element to this as well as a moral concern with that, with that um, immoral relationship. The other matters of moral purity had more to do with being separate in Israel's conduct from the immoral, idolatrous ways of the pagans that were around them. The, the heathens who worshipped false gods, man, their worship practices brought all kinds of, of disgusting debauchery as part of their worship. You know, you can't really separate morality and spirituality. Those two go hand in hand. People try to treat them as two separate things in our secular society, but you can't quite divorce them. Look at these next three verses beginning in verse 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. He that sacrificeth unto any god, save unto the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. He talks about witches. I, I received a letter recently here at the church from a pagan witch here in Crookston. 
who did not appreciate receiving our gospel literature uh, on her door. Now, witchcraft, it, it's not just something that happens in the movies, all right? It's not just, um, you know, you grew up maybe in, in the era, era of watching Bewitched on TV, and it was just kind of innocent sitcom kind of fun. No, it, it's, it's very real, it's very dark, and it is in the world around us. Now, that doesn't mean that we're calling for uh, Exodus 22 execution upon all pagan witches. No, no, no. That was for a different time. It was for a different culture. But we do not, Christians, need to participate in such a culture of darkness. What What are you getting at, Pastor? Let me be more specific. Halloween is coming this month. And I know a lot of different Christians and a lot of different churches have different standards when it comes to how to approach Halloween. For my part, I want nothing to do with it. I don't view it as one of those creative outreach opportunities I was talking about this morning. For me, that's over the line. Uh, I view it as something touching the dark, something evil, something we have no business messing with. It's made to look fun. It's made to be cute. It's portrayed as being, man, it's all about the kids. There's better ways for your kids to have fun. The kids that came out here uh, yesterday for the fall festival left with bags full of candy. There's there's better ways to get good chocolate and candy and stuff. And, And God told his people Israel here, you need to steer clear of having anything to do with these dark, wicked practices of the lost people around you. And that's still solid advice for God's people today. Still good. Let's move on to section number three regarding positions of power. Positions of power. The principle behind this one is treat people right. Verse 21. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about in chapter 21 how that you could not have a Hebrew slave permanently, that there was a term limit of the servitude, which was six years, and in the seventh year he would go out free. And maybe if someone was reading through chapter 21, they're thinking, okay, well, I can't have a permanent uh, Hebrew slave, but hey, it doesn't say anything about a term limit for uh, foreign slaves. Maybe I could bring somebody from another land. Nope, right here, you can't vex or oppress a foreign stranger because that's what happened to you, Israel. They could not, they had, foreigners would have the same sort of rights, the same responsibilities as well as everyone else. They could not be dehumanized. They could not be oppressed just because of where they were from. Neither could they be oppressed if they had no way of standing up for themselves. And I think one of the good, one of the measures of the decency of a society is how it treats those who are poor and defenseless. Those who are poor and defenseless, do they have any standing? Do they have any recourse? How does society treat them? Look at verse um, 22 with me. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath shall wax hot and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, your children fatherless. There's this larger reality that kind of makes an appearance here that's behind all of these laws. It's not just like, okay, Israel, society, uh, you need to impose justice and and give fairness, and you have to have just penalties and all this. Uh, It's not just that God is delegating all justice to uh, his people, Israel, and to the government. It was this principle as well that God himself was still watching, that he is a just God, and the Lord pays special attention to how the helpless are treated. You know, widows usually in our Western society are not in as quite a dire position 
as they were back then. And, and I'm thankful for that. That's a wonderful thing that we live in a society in a time where there is wealth enough and there is desire enough to look out for those in need. But man, in ancient times, if, if the man of the house died and there was no close male relative to step in on their behalf, these, these widows and these children, they'd be in a terrible, awful situation and, and could easily be taken advantage of. And it's interesting to me that the Lord doesn't even really give a penalty uh, to be imposed by the law. It's more like he says, listen, if you mess with them, you're going to deal with me directly. That's really what he's saying. What did he say? I will kill you. I will make your wife a widow. I will make your children fatherless. Try me. And if they're wise, they didn't. That would be a far worse judgment than if the judges of the land slapped them with some sort of fine. Another um, historical imbalance of power is often between the rich and the poor. Socialism's solution to that is, well, eliminate the rich. Then everybody's poor together and equal. That is not God's solution. His is that the rich are to be a blessing to the poor rather than making things harder for them. One thing that someone with extra money might be able to do is to lend some of their capital to those who need the money. And as long as there has been money, there have been loan sharks. There have been people that have tried to get rich off the backs of desperate people. Usury is mentioned in verse 25. It's charging interest on a loan. That word came up this morning, if you were paying attention. Interest. Um, Charging interest was not forbidden in Israel, except when it came to dealing with those who were very poor. And in that case, the way to show kindness to a very poor citizen around you, a poor neighbor, would be to lend him the money that he needed and charge no interest upon him. And so the poor in Israel didn't have um, like welfare safety net like like we have today, but they did have some helps that were built into the law to make sure that they were not being unfairly oppressed. The other concession for the poor was that if the only thing he could offer by way of collateral was his coat, the wealthy lender couldn't hold on to that overnight when that poor man would need to shelter himself from the cold. So, I mean, you're talking about somebody in extreme poverty here. No shelter, not another coat to wear. And, of course, if you give him the coat back, well, it doesn't serve as very effective collateral anymore. I mean, he might take the money and the coat and book it out of town. He might be gone. But the Lord, he he promised that he would would make up the difference. You know, just be gracious. Because if you don't, And that poor man cries out to God because you have been callous towards his plight. The Lord will hear and he will intervene in ways that will be far more costly to you than whatever you were hoping to gain by that collateral. Look at verse 26 with me. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by, by that the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. Just You you just be gracious like God is gracious, and he'll take care of the business stuff, right? You be gracious. The end of this particular section regarding those in positions of power over others and the importance of treating people right, is this interesting verse, verse 28. It says, Thou shalt shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. The Hebrew word there for gods is Elohim. You've heard that word before. Elohim is, is a plural word. It means something like mighty one. And it signifies something or someone just great and mighty. And most often it's translated God, capital G-O-D in the Old Testament. And, it, and it's plural because, well, God is a three-in-one being. He's the Trinity. But also uh, the plural form sort of like exalts it to this place of supremacy, right? He is, he is the God of gods. 
And, but it's also, it's also a word that's used to speak of the false gods and the, the pagan deities. And that's usually what it means when we see it translated like this in verse 28, uh, gods with small g. But did you know there are other usages of Elohim in the Bible? Uh, the city of Nineveh, Brother Levi, was said to be an Elohim city. It, it was an it was a exceeding great city. Uh, earlier in Exodus 22, the word was translated judges, all right? So verses 8 and 9. So those who are powerful authorities, they are representatives of God's authority, right? They are mighty ones acting on behalf of the mighty one. So that command, boy, that lines right up with some of the things we, we know in the New Testament New Testament about giving due honor and respect to those in leadership, to those in places of governmental authority. Uh, Jude, he warns that likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. I know that our political process can get, get us pretty fired up sometimes. And there's no doubt that much of what goes on in government is fueled by evil and and evil spiritual forces in high places. But as Christians, as ambassadors of Christ, we've got to be very careful not to revile those in positions of leadership, no matter how much we might disagree with them politically. Think about the, the apostles who wrote the New Testament, man, they lived under way worse tyrants than we've ever lived under. And and you don't ever find these statements of of just disrespect and insults being hurled toward them. In fact, one time, the Apostle Paul was on trial. Acts 23, the high priest came in, Ananias, and uh, he had Paul punched in the face just as a part of the trial and intimidation and things. And Paul lashed out like you might. And he said, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, like you hypocrite. And uh, Luke records for us and says, they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? And then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So was he a hypocrite? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But Paul basically took it back and explained that he said it not knowing he was speaking to the high priest. Now, where did Paul get that sort of principle that he quoted? Right here, Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight. 28. Be careful how you address those in positions of authority. Be cautious. Always honor the office, even when you can't find a lot of respect or honor for the person in that office. So whether that's the pastor or whether it's the governor or the police officer that pulls you over or your least favorite president, Paul wrote in Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. So regarding those in positions of power. We've looked at the rights and responsibilities of Israel um, regarding property, uh, purity, and power. Let's, let's move on to chapter 23 now, to the rights and responsibilities regarding matters of principle. And when it comes to matters of principle, here's, here's what you need to do. Do what's right. That makes sense, doesn't it? Do what's right. The only way for any system of justice to work is when people speak the truth. I think the opposite is also true, that in order for a system of government to fail, to descend into like oppression and tyranny, a lot of people have to be willing to lie. A lot of people have to be willing to ignore truth. So if you're called to testify in court, you'd be asked to swear an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and anything else constitutes perjury, and it It really derails any kind of system of justice when witnesses lie and perjure under oath. Verse 1 of chapter 23 is basically talking about that. Thou shalt not raise a false 
report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You remember when King Ahab um, looked out his window and desired the, the nice, pretty vineyard that was just right next to his palace, and it was owned by a man named Naboth. And he approached Naboth and said, hey, I'll offer you top dollar for your vineyard. And Naboth said, I can't. This is the inheritance God's given to me and my family. I can't, I can't sell it in good conscience. And Jezebel arranged for false witnesses to pull Naboth up above the people and to say, we heard this man blaspheming the king and God. Naboth was a righteous man, and people knew it. But these, these false witnesses, these liars, uh, had him convicted, and because there were multiple of them, executed. We have to take the truth seriously. Remember this. It doesn't matter how many people are repeating the lie. It doesn't matter how many people are going the wrong way or how unpopular the truth may be. As God's people, we must be people of principle and truth. Always speak and follow the truth. Look at verse 2, chapter 23. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Doesn't matter how many are doing it. You do what's right. Truth matters in every situation. Even situations where you'd kind of like to help someone out. So the ends don't justify the means. Look at verse 3 with me. Such an interesting verse. It says, Neither shalt thou countenance a poor man in his cause. Now, we've heard a lot of, you know, good things about the poor. Like God cares about the poor and he has compassion upon the poor and we need to watch out and be a help to the poor. But that doesn't mean you have so much compassion that you would lie for someone that you'd really like to help out. Don't think, well, you know what? That rich guy had it coming. The poor man only stole because his family was hungry. I don't think he deserves to be punished. So I'm going to alter my testimony so that he doesn't have to suffer any more than he's already suffered. You can't do that, child of God. No, the truth is the truth. And while you might have great understanding and compassion for that poor man in his plight, that is not reason to bend the truth to help someone escape the consequences of their decisions. But of course, a just society also always ensures that the poor are not oppressed. Verse, drop down to verse 6. Thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. So there's both sides of it. Make sure that truth and justice is done, no matter who it's for. Why does it give a verse like that? Well, because corrupt judges would be tempted to give verdicts that would favor the rich, that would favor the powerful, because they can stand to benefit from those kinds of people. But that would be a bribe, wouldn't it? It would be a terrible breach of ethics. Verse 8 says, And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. Now, we, we skipped a couple of verses, so let's back up to verse 4, a couple of really neat ones. Verse 4 and 5. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee, lying under his burden, and wouldst, wouldst forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. You get the picture? I mean, there's this, this neighbor. He doesn't like you. And you don't much like him. And the two of you have had it in for each other. You've come to, come to disagreements multiple times. This is your enemy. And his animals get out of their, their fence. And you think, oh, good. Maybe you give, a, give it a slap on the hind end and say, yeah, get out of here. I didn't see nothing. No. He says, you need to stop, and you need to grab that animal, and you need to bring it back to your neighbor and say, hey, your cow got loose, just bringing it back to you. Well, why should I go out of my way to help that guy? Because it's the right thing to do, because it's honest, because it's honorable. You see a car that's spun out into the ditch in the winter, and he's stuck, 
And as you get closer, you're getting ready to stop, but then you realize, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Have a good one, buddy. No, it doesn't matter if he would do it for you or not. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if he deserves such a kindness. You represent a gracious God, do you not? A gracious God who has done more for you than you deserve? Yes. So do the right thing. Love your enemy. And people say there's no mercy and grace in the Old Testament. Oh, the law, it's so judgmental. No, this sounds like something right out of the Sermon on the Mount. Help out your enemy. And what's so wonderful about it, if you, if you notice, there's no penalty for not doing it under the law. Why? Be, well, because it's basically unenforceable. How would, you ever know, how would anybody ever know if you had or hadn't done it? All you got to do is say, oh, I never saw it, you know? Nobody can enforce this upon you. It's a matter of principle. It's the right thing to do. So just do it. Now let's look at the la at last point here of Israel's rights and responsibilities. Number five, regarding giving God priority. The priority or worship right. In, in Mos the law of Moses, the law that God gave to Israel, there's no like nice, clean separations between civil commands and like spiritual religious commands. All right? there, there's no separation of church and state under Israel's law. Uh, every civil command that's given is ultimately a spiritual one in nature. And, and so it's, it's very normal as we go throughout this to find... Um, other commands that we would consider to be more like religious or worship-oriented, just kind of woven right in to these civil laws that are given. So verse, verse 10, and 10, 11, and 12 have to do with putting God first by honoring the Sabbath day and uh, reinforces that importance of a weekly day of rest there in verse 12. And if you look at it, verse 12, six days thou shalt do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest that thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thine hand, thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. I love those words, to, to rest, to be refreshed. And it's not just so that you can be refreshed. It's that, that your animals would be refreshed. And it's so that the servants and the, the strangers in your land, so that they'll be refreshed. Meaning God cares about all people. He cares about all creatures even, that they be able to enjoy times of rest and refreshment. And maybe, maybe that was the little reminder you needed again tonight, that taking a, a break once in a while, taking a day off, taking a vacation, should not make you feel guilty, that those sorts of times of refreshment are, are God's gift he, he wants those things for us, and it's really essential if we're going to remain at peak strength as we serve him. There are some other details here about observing not only the, the weekly Sabbath, but the Sabbath years. Every seventh year, they were to let the land rest, and it was shown here to be a help to the poor once again, and even sort of, a, I would call it a, a conservation effort for the wild animals. Look at verse 11. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat. Do you see how our God is a good God? And he cares about his people. He cares about his creatures. There's no other God that's ever been served anywhere that has this kind of a good and caring heart. For those beneath him. Only this God is worthy of such worship. And he told them in verse 13 that they, they shouldn't even make mention of the names of other gods. No other, no other gods should be worshipped. Don't be talking about them. You don't need to discuss these other gods. Leave them alone. The Lord was to be the sole object of their adoration. As we come to the end of the book of the covenant, there were three feasts mentioned. We're not going to cover them in a lot of detail here tonight. And um, I'm hoping, praying, the Lord will let us go into uh, the book of Leviticus eventually. And they're covered in much more detail there. But every year, there were three major holy day feasts 
where, where all the men, specifically, were to gather before the Lord. And it was optional for women and children, but not for the heads of household. And so the first feast there in verse 15 speaks of the feast of unleavened bread. And that's tied to uh, the Passover and when, uh, commemorating when they came out of Egypt. The second was called in verse 16, the feast of harvest, the first fruits. Later on in the law, it's called the feast of weeks. Or we know it by the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost was uh, in the early summer months. The the first wheat fields were just coming ripe and being harvested. And they would come then and take the, the very first and the very best of the beginning of their harvest and offer it unto the Lord, uh, basically dedicating the whole harvest season unto God. And then the third big feast was at the end of the harvest, and that was called the Feast of Ingathering or uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. The nation of Israel just finished this, by the way. They had uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then that was a very solemn day. And then they had the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles is, is Simchat Torah, is that, I think, Simchat Torah, and, and it marks like the end of the public readings, and that was that big celebration day was the day in which they were attacked here just this last week, a special high Sabbath day for those people. But that, that feast, those days, they go way back, I mean, Exodus 23 back. And, uh, and that, but that was, it, the, it was kind of the celebration that all the labor in the fields was over, and it was a time to celebrate and thank God for all of his provision for them. Now, like I said, the pagans that surrounded Israel, uh, they were involved in all sorts of dark cultic practices that they would use to try to gain favor of their gods, especially when it came to things like fertility and fields and crops and all of that. One of those seems to be this strange practice of taking a a baby goat that was still nursing and boil it in its mother's milk. And then they would take like this this magical stew and, and sprinkle it out in their fields as a fertility ritual. The Lord didn't want his people messing around with any of those strange superstitions. He want, all he wanted for them was just bring your offerings, bring your thanks unto me. That's why verse 19 here, the last verse of the book of the covenant, ends kind of uh, surprisingly where he says, well, let's read verse 19. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. You say, what in the world? Well, th- well that's, that's what it's talking about there. Now, Orthodox Jews take that to mean that you cannot mix meat and dairy products in the same meal. So if we get to go to Israel, there's no cheeseburgers on the menu. But this was not a dietary law. That wasn't even the context of this. This is talking about the, the harvest time. It's talking about the feast of ingathering. Now, I, I know I bounced around a little bit. Back up to, with me here at the end of or chapter 22. Yeah, end of chapter 22, verse 29. I wanted to bunch these, these um, laws about worship together. Verse 29, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors. The firstborn of thy sons shalt thou give unto me. And so these, these verses sprinkled throughout, they're basically saying one thing. Put the Lord first. Give him priority in everything you have, in everything that you do. In verse 31 begins, and ye shall be holy men unto me. That's what the Lord was interested in. He wanted his people to be holy so that he could dwell among them. We talked about that in Sunday school, how important it is that that we get to come into fellowship with this holy God. And it, so it's about, you know, when we talk about all these things, this is, this is what I want you to take away from this message is that I understand that, that these areas of justice and morality and these, these principles kind of affect a lot of ethical parts of our lives, but ultimately it's about living in a holy fashion that is pleasing unto God. We understand that the the details and the penalties of this covenant, they're not binding upon us, but God still desires a holy people. 
God deserves to be first in our lives. Everything we have belongs to him. That's what the first fruits signified. It's not like, well, this little bit of grain belongs to God. It's like, you know, all the grain in all the fields belongs to you, God. We're going to take this little bit to show that it's all dedicated unto you. So, so don't, in your life, just like in the law, don't try to separate the spiritual from the secular in, in your life. Recognize that your whole life is to be a spiritual endeavor meant to please God. Like in the book of the covenant, the Lord is to be woven into every part of our lives. Everything we do, everything we have, everything that we are, it's all his. And he comes first. So let that stick with you above all the others, that it's, it's about more than property stuff here. It's about more than power or matters of principle. I would say it's even more than about purity. Let it be this reflection that God is the singular priority of our lives. Nothing is higher than him. Let's live in that holy fashion unto our God who is worthy. Amen? And amen. All right, let's stand to our feet.